welcome back to my lab in Redwood City, California, for those of you who have been with us across this Masterclass AAV series. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Peter Holper. I'm an application scientist here at SciEx. As some of you may know, um, you know prior to joining SciEx just a few years ago, I, I mainly worked in analytical development in biopharma industry uh, for quite a few years. And over those years, I spent a lot of time developing uh, antibody therapeutics, working on some fusion proteins, some insulin products, even spent some time developing an ADC molecule. So really, we're here to discuss a capillary gel electrophoresis workflow for AAV genome integrity analysis that's going to allow us to uh, not only just determine the AAV genome size, but we're going to take a look at that genomic purity, that transgene integrity. We're going to see how we can calculate the genomic titer and also look at some other potentially process-related impurities. I'm going to show you by the end of today how you can calculate a very nice, reliable, full-to-empty capsid ratio for your AAV products. So let's go ahead now and take a few minutes to review the background and analytical really characteristics of AAV and overview a bit the CGE method for AAV genome integrity analysis. So this genome integrity analysis is, is quite important. It's not something that everybody thinks of you know, right away when they're getting into the AAV space. But we really need to use it to, to monitor both our product and process-related uh, substances or impurities. As we know, as you're thinking about it, the quality of that transgene that we're delivering inside of our viral vector is really going to impact the infectivity uh, in our patient, the efficacy of our drug, and potentially the safety of that gene therapy into our patients. Because right? so we think about that transgene within our AAV genome, uh, that transgene might not be present at all. We just have an empty capsid delivery, no payload. Um, the transgene could be uh, just truncated, right? A shortened version. We could also have uh, a contaminant fragment, something from the host cell or plasmid that got encapsulated in our in our viral vector. So we really do need this key workflow to help us monitor some of these. So with our AAV genome integrity workflow, we really have two sample prep options. We have a, on the top what we call our standard workflow, and, um, and that will allow us to monitor more product-related impurities. Then we have a quicker workflow there described in the bottom that's going to allow us to look at our product and process-related impurities. So in either workflow, we're starting with our AAV samples. So we're going to have our samples there. They're going to be, you know, some are fully filled with our, our genome of interest. Some are going to be have potentially partially filled with a truncated genome, some may be filled with something that we didn't want to encapsulate. And then we'll obviously have some unencapsulated nucleic acid material. So in our standard workflow, we're going to use an endonuclease to chop up all of that unencapsulated nucleic acid material so that we're really just looking at what's within our AAV product. Once we've chopped that up, we're going to use a protease uh, to dissemble the capsid so that we can release the encapsulated nucleic acids. Then we're going to purify that those nucleic acids away from the protein and run our analysis on that purified sample. Now, if we want to get again that the quicker workflow that can give us an idea of our both product and process-related uh, impurities in our samples, we can just take that sample, that AAV sample with both our our uh, fully encapsulated genome, our truncated genome, potentially our mis uh, genome there. And then all the unencapsulated material as well. And we can just purify all of that away from the capsid and then run that material. So what does it look like? Well, let's take a look here. Um, so here we've got an electrophorogram, an example electrophorogram of an AAV genome of about 2.4 thousand bases. So we can see there our main peak running right at about 2.4 kb. But then we also see a lot of smaller related substances. And those Related substances could be partial genome, they could be you know, truncated genome, they could be contamination fragments. We might even have host cell DNA or host cell RNA that got co-purified with our sample. So there's a lot of stuff going in here that we need to monitor, we need to uh, try to eliminate or at least uh, keep it to a very low abundance so that we have the highest amount of intact genome that we, that we can. Now, as I mentioned, this assay is going to give you a much better sieving range, a much better uh, resolution on size determination than some of those other 
uh, methodologies that are out there. So here we're looking at two different genome sizes for an AAV serotype 2 capsid. So the one on the bottom there was a 2.4 thousand base uh, genome length that we had just seen. And then right above it is a 4.7 thousand base genome length. And so you can see we have quite a bit of resolution there, a few, uh, uh, certainly more than baseline resolve, well over a minute. And in both cases, we have quite a bit of potentially partial genome and other impurities that we really don't want to have in the, that sample. So we do see a very nice strong peak there, well resolved intact genome. Uh, but we do also have to monitor all those smaller species. And what we might see on a gel, we might have a lot of uh, smears. But on CGE, you can really get a high sensitivity, high resolution method, really brings you into, into today's methodology. What about other AAV serotypes? This method is really serotype independent. In fact, it can work on any type of single-stranded uh, nucleic acid uh, sample that you have. So here we're looking at four different AAV serotypes. We're going to AAV serotype 2, serotype 5, serotype 8, and serotype 9. And here we, in each one, we can see the intact genome there coming out in about 12 and a half minutes. And depending on which sample we're looking at, we have different amounts of related substances or impurities there migrating well before it. So again, all we're doing in this assay, we're just extracting that genome and then running our single-stranded analysis. So it doesn't matter what our starting material was. As long as we're able to extract that genome, we can get a very high resolution, high throughput method here that we're discussing with capillary gel electrophoresis. All right, so now let's go over the Biophase 8800 system, give you a quick little hardware overview of this system that's really going to enable this high throughput, high resolution workflow we've been, we've been detailing. So right over here to my left is our Biophase 8800 system. And one of the first things that you're going to notice is this front panel. This is a touch panel. Um, and on it, we have a few different options. Right? We have different icons here that we can press to directly control the instrument, run our sequence, or even view our, our run as it's going. Now, we can slide this over to my right. And that's going to reveal our cartridge loading location. So where we're going to place our cartridge is right in here. And it just sort of snaps into place. And then up here, yes, right there, there we go. Uh, this is where we're going to load our coolant when we, when we, if we ever need to load additional coolant. And that coolant, uh, this system uses the same recirculating liquid coolant that those of you familiar with the P100 Plus use. That coolant allows us to run at a set capillary temperature. It allows us to run at high voltages. It allows us to really keep that temperature constant throughout our run from the first sample down to the last one across all eight capillaries in this case. And it will allow us to have very good migration time reproducibility. Now, our sample and reagent locations are going to be just a little bit further to my left. And we'll, we'll go over that a little bit more later when we load our trays. Now, this method that we're discussing today you, was going to use a 520 nanometer emission filter. That stands in contrast a little bit to the filter that we used for our AAV purity assay, which used a 600 nanometer filter. Now, this is a very, very nice design because to swap them out, it really is like a USB drive just on your computer. You're just going to pop it right in, take the old one right out and you'll be set to go. Now, if you want to see how we change a filter, just how easy that is, we're not going to go into that today, but you can look back at our AAV masterclass for that um, AAV protein purity assay and check out how that's done. All right, so yeah, let's look at some of these consumables that we're going to be using on our Biophase 8800. So the first thing that we're going to look at is our cartridge, right? This cartridge is a completely new design, different than our P800 Plus, obviously. This is what enables all of that high throughput analysis. So the biophase cartridges are all pre-assembled. Everything just comes in a box, ready to go. Um, all eight capillaries we can see are in here on the inlet side. Each capillary has its own individual electrode. Each capillary is going to be rinsed and electrophoresed independently of each other. Now, all those capillaries are going to come up and over the top here. And you can kind of notice this partition right here. This is where the coolant is going to be flowing around those capillaries to keep our temperature controlled. Now, all eight of those capillaries are going to 
thread around here to our detection window, you'll also notice that there is no more uh, there are no more apertures. So there's really nothing that you need to do, whether you're using UV or lift analysis. There's no aperture here. It's just our detection window. And then all eight of those capillaries are going to go down to the outlet side, where they're kind of bundled together here. And on the outlet side, we do share one common electrode. Now, if we flip this cartridge over, we're going to notice a few things. Here, these two uh, o -ring, or openings with O-rings, this is where our coolant is going to be circulating in and out of the cartridge. Over here and here, this is also where our pressure is being applied. So again, this is a new design um, a, compared to our PN or plus, where pressure is being applied to the bottom. But applying it to the sides here is going to allow us to have a lot less user involvement, a lot less cleaning of the instrument or even of the cartridge. Now, I myself, but when I run, I really just take a Kim wipe. I wipe down the O-rings that surround the uh, capillary and electrodes on the bottom, make sure those are clean, and then I'm ready to go. There really is not much you have to do here. The last thing that is of note over here is our RFID chip. Now that RFID chip is going to track the capillary's first run and the amount of runs that have been put across it. Now there's no upper limit of runs, so as long as that capillary is running good for you, you just keep on using it but it is nice for traceability. Now that RFID chip also knows the capillary length and the type of capillary that you're using. And that will uh, we'll circle back to that when we get into the method. Let's look at our RNA 9000 kit that really enables all of this separation. So we open this box up, and then we can see that within our larger box, we have two smaller boxes. And that is actually kind of nice. So these Reagents already come in their own secondary containment. So we have two different colors here. We have an orange box. This box is meant to be stored uh, at ambient temperature. And here we just have our CE grade water. We have a couple bottles of that. And we have a bottle of our um, acid wash. Now in this green box, this is going to be stored in refrigerated conditions. We have our gel separation buffers. This really enables that, that high resolution method is this gel. Uh, separation buffer. We have a few different vials of our Cyber Green 2 uh, fluorescent dye, as well as our uh, lift test mix to help calibrate our detector. Now, our gel really does allow us to have that high resolution. And we do call this the RNA 9000 kit because the highest um, ladder in our standard is 9000 bases. But that doesn't mean you can't go above that. Which of course, we all like things that can do a little more than advertise. Um, next, let's check out our plates. So on biophase, everything is 96 volt plate based. So here we have our reagent plate. And you can kind of see that each one has its own individual well. So all eight capillaries are going to have their own individual well. As I mentioned, they're all going to uh, rinse independently and ectrophoresis independently. Now on that outlet side of the capillary, they were all bundled together and they had one electrode. So they're going to go in more of this trough on our outlet plate. Now if we look at the front of the plate, the, our reagent plate has a key over here, as well as a notch, uh, well, 45 degree angle cut up here. This is just going to make sure that you orient this correctly when we put it onto the system. Now our outlet plate is a much smaller dimensions and it also has that 45 degree angle here just to make sure this is oriented on the system correctly. So our, our sample plate now, also 96 volt plate base, same idea. Each capillary is going to have its own individual well. And the, the key now is on the other side. So make sure that you don't put your sample plate where your reagent plate should go. Now, the sample plate also is going to have a reagent plate that goes along with it for the reagents that are needed when we're introducing the sample. Now, the biophase software is completely redesigned with the end user in mind. So over here in biophase software, we have a number of different um, tiles as well, just like our front panel. And the first one that we're going to be looking at is our reagent editor. We can take a look at our RNA reagent set. So what does this really mean? Well, on the P800+, Plus, what we really had to do was define a static location for each reagent. We might have water. In position A1, we might have a gel separation buffer in B1 and C1, uh, maybe our acid rinse in uh, D1, maybe more water in E1. 
and all of those were very static locations. So they were always in that, that same spot every single time you ran it and you would have to, the system would increment it every so many injections or every so many times the method was being run. But the biophase allows us to be much more dynamic. So all we're doing here is we're defining what reagents we're ever going to want to use either on the inlet side of the capillary or the outlet side of the capillary. So here we're defining we're going to use water, uh, an acid rinse solution. We have a couple locations for water dips to rinse off the end uh, outside of our capillary. We're also going to have a gel separation buffer to just rinse through the capillary, as well as ones that we want to go to during the separation. And all that's on our inlet side. Now on our outlet side, we're going to have some of those same reagents. So we're going to have the water dips again. We're going to have water. Uh, we're also going to have waste. And that waste for any of those rinses going from the inlet side to the outlet side, we need to have a place for that to go. And then finally, we're going to have our gel separation buffer for the separation. So this is all really going to come into play as we go through in our method editor and our sequence editor. So now we've defined the reagents that we're going to use in our separation. And now we have to build our method. So we can go into our method editor and go over here, find the method that we want to look at. You can see an overview up here. We can see the, in the, the reagents that we want to use here as well. If we go over to the method settings now, we can still set our capillary temperature. We can still set our sample storage temperature. We can still have the system wait until those temperatures are reached before the, the assay is started. We have the same you know, UV and lift detection. What is kind of nice here, and I mentioned it with that RFID chip, is you're actually going to specify what capillary type you're using and what capillary length you're using, so that if you end up in, if you end up inserting the wrong capillary, it's not going to allow you to run the method if there's a mismatch. So it'll stop you from making that mistake. Now over here, you can choose for lift, you can choose your emission wavelength, and then you have a few data collection um, settings that you can adjust. Now, if we go into the method program, each one of these is color coded as well. So we have our nice rinse in this blue, our injections in purple, our separates in green, and our weights are in orange. And if what we want to do, we want to add one down here, all we have to do is drag and drop. And then we can go over here to our drop down menus and our inlets, and we get all of those reagents that we had. Uh, listed as possible inlet reagents. So we can choose that. And then all of our reagents that we had listed as outlet reagents. We set our duration, set the applied pressure. You can see it's also added this down here to our timeline. Now, if we decide, oh, you know what? I didn't actually want to do that. All we have to do is drag it into the trash can and it's gone. So here we're starting with just a, an acid rinse. Then we'll do a water rinse. We'll do a gel separation buffer rinse. We'll do a pre-injection voltage separation, a water dip, inject our sample from our 96 well plate. We can do either pressure or electric voltage injections if we want to. We'll do another water dip, and then we'll do our separation. Now, once we have our method written, now is the time that we're going to go and build our sequence in our sequence editor. Let's go ahead and start with a new blank sequence here. So we're going to go over here to our uh, to our project folder. On the bottom left here, you're going to see our sample plate layout. Here's just a look at our samples. And here are the methods that we had written. So in the sort of more teal color are our conditioning methods and our shutdown methods. And then the darker blue color are, are our separation methods. Now, the software knows this because separation methods have an in inject step, but the conditioning and shutdown methods do not have an injection step. So we want to start with maybe a conditioning method. So we'll take this method, we'll drag it down, and we'll see that it highlights the whole plate because we're not injecting from any of the columns. Now, if we take our separation method and drag it down, we'll see that it just highlights one of these columns because this method is being applied across all eight capillaries at the same time. So we can then see this populate over here. And if we want to re-inject a sample for any reason, we want to do replicate injections, we just drag it back onto that column. Now, at the end, if you say, you know what, I actually didn't want to do that, um, then you can see the replicates over here. But if you didn't want to do that, you just select it, click Delete, and it goes away. Well, finally, we'll take our shutdown method, drag that down again. It highlights the whole plate and populates over here. 
We can expand any of these, add in our sample information. We can adjust the run type, and we can change where the um, where the data files are going to be stored. The last thing that we want to highlight here is the error recovery. This is a nice feature that's new to Bioface software. So if the, the instrument runs into an error of any kind while it's running any of these methods, it's going to default to that error recovery method to try to run it. So it's not just going to leave your, your system there for you know, overnight just in, uh, in limbo. It's going to try and run that error recovery method to shut it all down. Now, let's go to the next tab. So here we have our 96-row plate. We have our outlet plate. We have our uh, reagent plate over here and our outlet plate over here. And we'll see that all of our reagents are sort of in different places. And the, the software is going to order this based on how it's being used. So first it did a water rinse, then an acid rinse, then a gel rinse, water dips, separation, water dip again. But because biophase software is so new, this was really done well, you can drag these to wherever you want. These are not static locations. Everything is dynamic. I like to group all my waters together in the front. I like to have my rinse buffers sort of in the middle. I like to have my gel buffers at the end. Um, and then you can also see for the outlet, I like to group these all together as well, where we really have the waters here, our waste in the middle, and our gel at the end. Now, once we save this sequence, we're going to go back to the biophase um, front panel. We're really going to import our method. We're going to finalize the instrument setup. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's see. We did a very brief overview of the front panel. Well, let's see exactly what all of these buttons can do. So our first button here is direct control. So within direct control, we have all of the same settings that we're used to on our P under plus. We can manually set the temperature for our cartridge or sample storage. We can do manual rinses, manual injections, manual separations. We can check um, our cartridge info, of what we have installed. This is also where we're going to load our plates. So here we go ahead and we select uh, eject reagent. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a reagent plate from the park location. So currently it's parked underneath where the cartridge would be. And it's going to bring it over to our side panel so that we can load it. And once it gets there, it's about there, it's going to slide that lid back. And now we can take our reagent plate, plop it in there, take our outlet reagent plate, put that in there. And now that that's loaded, we'll just come back to our front panel, click load reagent. It slides that cover back, and then it's going to move that reagent plate back to the center of the system where the capillary is. So it always keeps the capillary immersed in water, just like our home position on the P800+. Plus. Now, once that's done loading, we're going to now eject our sample plate. So we press that button. We can see the lid uh, moving back here. And right underneath our sample plate is really just our, our coolant. It keeps it nice and cool at our set point. So we put those in there, make sure those are input correctly. And click that button again to load that sample plate. And it's going to put that into its sample home location. So now that that's done, it's put it into place. We're going to slide this back over. We're going to take our cartridge. I'm just going to slide it right in here. And we kind of feel it click into place. And slide this back over. Click that ejected button, and now it's going to lock it. So what it's going to do is it's going to take that cartridge. It's going to push it against a side panel there so that the, that the O-rings where it's applying pressure are really sealed up against that wall. So now we see our cartridge is loaded. So we're pretty much ready to go. So let's keep exploring what else we have going on here. So our next um, button here, our next icon that we're going to do is our run sequence. So over here, we can go down to our RNA method that, that we had looked at. Load that up. It's already loaded. How convenient for us. And here we can see what we, had, we were showing you on the screen on the Biophys computer. So we have our conditioning method. We have two sample injections. We have our shutdown method. Now, if we expand this, we can see all of the method conditions for that conditioning method. If we expand our reagents over here, we can see exactly where our reagents should be. And this gives us a nice final check to make sure that we put or pipetted our reagents in the correct location. If we didn't, we can always go back 
and adjust it as needed. Likewise, we can look at our uh, separation method here for our samples. And what we might do, you know, for this first set of the samples is just run our standard curve, right? We can, we can generate a, a genomic tighter standard curve all in one go. Basically in one injection, we get eight data points or eight calibration points. No, so we're ready to go. We feel good. Everything looks right. We can go ahead and just click that button to run our sequence. And if we go back here to our capillary view, we can see something very nice. This is very cool. Um, we can tile all eight capillaries together. We can overlay them. We can go to a mixed view where you get your absorbance or your fluorescence trace, as well as your uh, current trace. Or you can just look at the current of all eight capillaries as they're running. I think that's super neat. If you aren't running all of them, you can always uncheck them over here. And another nice thing of the software is I didn't turn my laser on before I started this method. But Biophase software is finally smart enough, a software smart enough to know that if you're using the laser or if you're using the UV, um, it'll just turn it on for you. Very nice to have. I'll also mention that both the UV and the laser are on board the system at all times. So there's no more swapping out detectors. We're really just going ahead um, and you can swap from one or the other with no user involvement. Let's jump into our data analysis. So we go back to our home screen on Biophase software, click over here on data analysis, and open our data files. We'll navigate to where they had saved from our from our sequence. Over here, you can see we have eight um, data files from our eight different capillaries, A through H. And this is how we actually generated our standard curve for the genomic titer. So we can see here we have our, our really intact genome here. And then this sample in particular has quite a bit of likely partial genome uh, or truncated genome. So what we're going to want to do is start integrating. So on the right here, we have our integration parameters. We have peak width, positive threshold, minimum cluster distance. And then from this drop-down menu, we have a number of different options. So I'd like to just start with suspending the integration. So really turning the integration off in this front part of the electrophorogram to make sure nothing is um, nothing is integrated there. So I might go you know, zero to, say, eight minutes. And then this little play button for those of us that you know remember CD Walkmans and, and, and the such. Uh, we click that and just see how the integration does. Well, that, that, that's fine. We might want to adjust this a little bit. We can bring our peak width up a little bit. Uh, we can change that cluster distance. And we see once we change something, the parameters have been modified over here. And once I analyze it again, we'll see how that integrates. That's, that's pretty good. I'm pretty okay with that. I might change my positive threshold. So this positive threshold is this gray line and it's sort of like a minimum peak height. So if it doesn't pass that positive threshold, it's not going to integrate the peak. So I might maybe I'll move that down a little bit, see what that does. So now you can see we're really getting a lot of this stuff here. And we can see the peak area for our main uh, intact peak here. We also get you know, the peak area and relative peak area of the rest of our truncated genome. So this sample is only about 25% intact genome, not, not incredibly high. Now we've looked at that. We can look at all of our other samples. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take these same parameters so we can right click over here and we want to apply these parameters and analyze all of our samples. Now we can just go look through. We can see our peak areas dropping down a bit as we go through those solutions. That still does a pretty good job of integration. Maybe here I want to, oh, that, that's good. That's still, that's still one of those peaks of interest. Oh, it's pretty good. Um, one of the cool things with Biophase software is we can overlay incredibly easily. So we click this button here, and then all of these are going to light up in different colors. And then we click this tab over here, and here we've added them all to our overlay. Here, if you overlay them like this, you can kind of see the peak area is dropping from serial dilution to serial dilution. So that's quite nice. And then if you have your peaks named, um, you can see over here, 
you can look at your peak area. Corrected peak area. You can sort of get an idea of, of where we were as far as that zero dilution goes. So we're under about 300, going down to just under 150, to about 60, to about a little over 30, eight, four, and a little above, or a little under two. So a very nice zero dilution there. And that is how we can um, build our calibration curve for genomic titer. So here, what's being presented, we can see on the left that the same um, eight samples that we were looking at, but really just looking at that intact genome peak. Right? So we have a known titer of that size standard that was then serial diluted, and we can plot the corrected peak area against that titer to build our standard curve for genome titer. Now we get an R squared of about 0.99 or above 0.99, so a very you know, linear um, standard curve. You can see at the bottom, our LOD is just above one times 10 to the 10. You could probably push that a little bit lower as needed. And then that genome titer, as we mentioned at the beginning, how can we use that to uh, get to our full empty? Well, if we recall back to our previous AAV masterclass session where we were looking at AAV purity, we can build that same type of standard curve with our AAV purity method. So here we're looking at the protein capsid. So here we had a, a, a P503 labeled, so fluorescently labeled capsid. We were looking at just the peak area for VP3 and plotting that tighter against corrected peak area. Again, we have a nice linear relationship, R squared above 0.99 again. So now we can estimate the titer of an unknown sample, both of that unknown sample's genome titer, as well as its protein titer. And we can combine those two together to get a look at our full empty ratio. And that full empty ratio is critically important, right? We all know that we need it. How we get to it can be a challenge. A lot of the methodologies out there take a lot of time, a lot of sample. But here, we're using two methods that you're probably already using or looking to use in your lab. And this is how can you get even more information out of those assays to not have to do yet another assay to look at your full MP ratio. So this, you're getting more information out of what you're already doing. Because we know that you know the full capsids are delivering, we really just want to deliver that intact gene into our patient cells. And only the full capsids are really going to impact the potency of our therapeutics. So if they're partially filled, that's not going to be delivering the right payload. And we know we need to monitor that because regulatory inevitably is going to be expecting us to be able to monitor that and have a way to do it. But we need to know throughout our process, how is that being done? So this really is a very key workflow. So not only is our genome integrity assay a key workflow, but then using that information and using the information from our protein purity assay to find our empty full product ratio is really a nice, nice, uh, nice workflow that we have here, we're describing here. So, you know, we've, we've discussed in our prior masterclass AAV protein characterization. We use CESDS with laser-induced fluorescence to look at that viral protein uh, purity profile, as well as that viral protein ratio. So what is the ratio of VP1, VP2, VP3? What other related substances are in there? What degradation products are in there? And now we've seen that we can also grab our protein titer from that assay of our unknown samples. And now here today, we've described our genome integrity assay, which is a very, very important assay, very good look at the encapsulated transgene. We look at not just the purity of it, but also the sizing of it. And while we're getting that information, we can estimate the genomic titer of our unknown samples. And then we take those two assays and put them together. We take the answers, those titer answers that we get from those two assays through a simple calculation we can calculate the full, partial, or empty ratio of our samples. It really is a new, unique approach um, to full and empty AV capsid analysis.
So in this example, this is exactly what we did in-house. We took an AAV reference standard, a reference material from Vigene as our test sample to see just how well did this work. So from our genome integrity analysis, we got a genome titer of about 2.2 times 10 to the 12. And then we ran that AAV um, capsid purity analysis, and we got a titer of about 2.65 times 10 to the 12. And then we just did that very simple ratio, taking that, that full um, or intact genome against our capsid titer. And we ended up with a ratio of about 84, just under 80, or sorry, just under 83 and a half percent full to empty. And how did that compare to how this has been done by that vendor through other techniques? Well, their TEM data was about 75%. Their AUC data was about 89%. And we were right there, right in the middle, I mean, within 5% of the AUC data, uh, within 10% of the TEM data, but really right there. So you can see you're comparing methods, you're comparing techniques to say, you know, this is a novel approach, but how does it compare to more of our tried and true methods? How does it compare to methods that, unfortunately, take a lot longer or much more expensive, take uh, you know, somebody who's very highly trained? Well, it's right there. You can see the data is right there in front of you. And these are methods. The best part is these are methods that you're probably already doing. We're just showing you how you can leverage, leverage your biophase to get even more information out of the assays you're currently running.